that tells you that there is something out there. Pretty hard to spoof that. Absolutely, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge National Labs, MacDill Air Force Base, Edwards Air Force Base, the remote test site in Nevada, also known as Air Force Flight Test Center Detachment 3. That's the actual terminology for Broom Lake facility. From what I hear you guys saying, there's something. I don't know who's building it, who's got the technology, who's got the brains, but there's, there's something out there that better than our airplane. So it's not us, that's one thing we know. We know that. I could say that with a very high degree of confidence. For someone to try to bust down the walls, it's not going to happen. You'd have to go to all these facilities, get into their vaults, then bring that out as a united coalition. Not one person couldn't do it. It would take a united coalition of acknowledged scientists to come forward with it. Okay, hello everyone. I want to thank you for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate the support and I want to take a special mention to highlight and thank the Cousin Brothers, Blake and Brent Cousins of Third Phase of Moon for helping me produce these videos. I could not do this without them, so I want to put out a special thanks to them. So what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for the support as well in the super chats. We've, we've now moved on to the next stage in YouTube. And so that's worked out really well. And, and I can certainly promise you that any support we get on this channel will be turned around 180 degrees and invested right back into the artwork, into the research, into the boots on the ground research. So again, thanks for the support. So today I have prepared a series of slides. And on this one, ladies and gentlemen, this is not going to be a 10 minute video. This is not going to be a 15 minute video. This is going to be a full deep dive comprehensive investigation on a typical boots on the ground research trip. And we always talk about that here on this channel. This time it's, it's real world boots on the ground research. So I'm going to cycle through these slides here take you with me on this Roswell road trip report that I'm calling this uh, presentation. And let's go ahead and begin. So we're, we're getting into Roswell now. This is the welcoming sign. And you can see as we're moving in, we'll begin, continue and go on to the next slide here. All right, so let's talk about the breakdown of the map here. Now, we've always heard that Roswell is typically this single event that's reached this legendary status. But in point of fact, ladies and gentlemen, and I've got, got the detail map. This has been confirmed and authorized by Don Schmidt, um, pretty much the world premier researcher in Roswell. What you're looking at is a detailed layout map of all the associated events that are typically wrapped into the Roswell event. So if you look down at the bottom here, and I've got Roswell here, and if you look 35 miles north on 285, that is in, in fact the impact site. So if we go all the way to the left, you'll see this big dot, and then just about five miles north of this big dot, you see another dot. And that's where we're going to start our analysis of the whole Roswell event. Now that smaller dot above the big dot on the left is what's called the touchdown site. That is where Lincoln La Paz, who is a meteorite expert, and Lewis Rickett discovered fused green glass, which is indicative of high heat. And they also found, and this is not talked about very much, they also found a black seamless box about the size of a bread box. And even today, 75 years later, we don't even know if that box has ever been opened. It's this seamless, mysterious black box. Now, approximately five miles south of the touchdown site is the debris field. That's where Mac Brazel, Rancho Mac Brazel and seven-year-old Timothy D. Proctor discovered all this debris this strange debris scattered over a three quarter mile radius. And they also found a 200 foot long gash that was about 10 feet wide. And we'll talk about that later. If we move on the trajectory now, that was from Northwest to Southeast. And I've got arrows showing you the uh, flight path here. And we'll go all the way to the impact site. Now there were five bodies recovered. One was still alive. At this location, they recovered two bodies. And they they also found, ladies and gentlemen, a survivor. And we're going to talk about the survivor later. Now, this was an egg-shaped craft about the size of a Volkswagen. It had a hull breach on the side of the craft, and there was a dome on top as well. 
kind of this brushed aluminum chrome exterior texture on the outside of the craft. Now, approximately two and a half miles west of the impact site is called the second body site, also known as the D. Proctor by uh, site, where at least two bodies were recovered for a grand total of five, including the impact site. So in a nutshell, that is the breakdown map of the four events associated with the Roswell incident. And I'm gonna take you scene by scene through this event here and let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is a photograph taken by Don Schmidt and you can see this ladies and gentlemen is the vicinity where all this took place. So this is July 2nd, 1947. This is 11.59 p.m. Just showing you the landscape. You can see this low rolling hills. There's virtually no trees whatsoever. We've got this low brush here and this is the, the New Mexico desert area here. And it's just this barren landscape. So it would be remote by car, but it wouldn't be remote by aircraft. So they could certainly see it. So just giving you a sight picture of what we're dealing with here. Let's move on to the next slide. So this event took place July 2nd, 1947. And there were a, a number of local ranchers who they said that they heard some strange loud booming noise between the thunderclaps some mysterious boom that they heard between the thunderclaps. And, and we believe that what perhaps happened is whatever this craft was, it got struck by an electrical storm lightning strike, which exceeded the tensile strength of the aircraft itself. Okay, so here you have Mac Brazel and then seven-year-old Timothy D. Proctor coming up upon the debris. So this is the morning of July 3rd, 1947 now. And can you imagine seeing this for the very first time. The sheep would not cross this debris field and they're looking at all this strange debris. You've got three different types of debris. Number one, you've got this very strange thin, you could call it a cigarette packaging that had kind of a chrome exterior uh, surface to it. And it was so thin, but yet you could not bend it. You could not scratch it. You could not burn it. You could not dent it with a 16 pound sledgehammer. That's like Number one. Number two, there was this very strange material, which is quote unquote, the holy grail memory metal, where you could crumple it up in your hand and you could release it. And this stuff would spread out like liquid mercury. And then it would take about 30 seconds to basically come down to the table below. So that's debris number two. Debris number three were these strange eye beam configurations with this strange pastel Im embedded and embossed you could call them hieroglyphics within the inner wall of the eye, eye beam, which uh, Jesse Marisol Jr. had discovered uh, on the kitchen table. So that's the three types of debris. Now let's move on to the next one. We'll take you to the crash site now. All right. So let's think about this. This occurred on July 2nd, 1947. So you've got the night of the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th. So whatever the craft was and whatever bodies were there were already laying out in the desert for like a good five to six days before the military really got on site. So you can see how there was this erosion, there was this deterioration and the bodies were actually getting, you could see the critters were involved. And so it was a gruesome sight when the military got on site. Now, if you look off to the left, you see the ambulance truck, there was a survivor. There's an 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy that you see in the background. This is again by Tom Bogan. There's also a Jeep. And then we've got the six by troop transport. And Don Schmidt said that the whole scene happened within about 200 feet of a water tank and also a windmill. Now, if you look in the foreground, you'll see this egg-shaped craft with a dome on top about the size of a Volkswagen. So it's about 13.9 feet across and then a hull breach on the side of the craft with the bodies being laid out and then over here to the left you see the survivor now i want to mention one thing that's not talked about very much don schmidt has confirmed this they did bring a civilian crane to the site which we don't have here we just didn't have room to put this in here and this is almost never talked about so the military commissioned a civilian crane to drive all the way up to the crash site and they helped hoist the craft onto the 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy. So let's move on to the next slide, and I'm going to go ahead and take you to the next scene. Now, this is the military convoy that 
multiple eyewitnesses, including two paper boys and basically multiple eyewitnesses. This is July 8th, 1947. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got this plus or minus 10 minutes. It was 4 p.m. when they saw these Jeeps going down Main Street. And even today, you can retrace the steps of how this convoy was going down Main Street. So you can imagine, you've got two Jeeps up in front. You've got this 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy with a strange egg-shaped craft on the trailer. It is concealed by a tarp with either ropes or chains concealing the entire craft itself. In back of the 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy, there were two other Jeeps as well. So here you can see this entire convoy going down Main Street heading toward Roswell Army Airfield 509th Bomb Group Headquarters, Hangar P3 Building 84. So let's move on to the next slide here. Okay, so we're now inside the hangar and off to the left, you can see the uh, six by troop transport. You see the debris in the back of the truck. Now, just to the right there, we've got the ambulance truck. Over to the far right, we've got the 18 wheeler tractor trailer low boy with the craft on it. And then if you look in the foreground, you see that the bodies now have been laid out on the hangar floor. Again, this is hangar P3, building 84, which ladies and gentlemen, you can actually go to and see today. Now, if you look off to the left, we definitely have confirmed reports that there were two small child-sized caskets where the bodies were placed inside the caskets. And then in the background off to the left, you can see that they're building this crate and they're, they're gonna go ahead and put the caskets into the wooden crate and those would be loaded inside the V-29. So that's kind of a, a layout of what happened inside the hangar. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next slide here. Okay, at this point, what they ended up doing is they put that wooden crate inside atomic bomb pit number one. This is July 8th, 1947. And they built two perimeter screens around the atomic bomb pit. So here, here's a question for everyone. If this is a weather balloon, if this is a weather balloon, which has been claimed, why would you have perimeter screens uh, protecting a weather balloon? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They actually had armed guards position inside both rings and with orders to shoot to kill anyone who tried to breach these perimeter screens all over a weather balloon. Doesn't make any sense. Let's move on to the next slide here. Now, what you see here, ladies and gentlemen, is the loading process of the wooden crate containing the, the caskets with the bodies. Now, how they brought this in, this is basically the, the next scene here. This is July 9th, 1947. Once they had the crate containing the bodies placed into the atomic bomb pit, what they would end up doing is they taxied a B-29 called Straight Flush over the atomic bomb pit. And by way of this hydraulic lifting device, they basically lifted the crate into the bomb bay of the B-29, and that's what they did here. And so we've got the scene here, and this is straight flush, which is one of the most historically significant aircraft ever to exist because it actually carried the bodies. And where did it go? It went to 8th Air Force Headquarters, Fort Worth, Texas. Now let's move on to the next slide here. All right, so here's a photograph of straight flush. And again, one of the most historic aircraft of all time but it was scrapped in July, 1954. Why would you scrap this historically significant B-29, one of the most significant historical aircraft of all time, but it's gone. So what is the only thing we have left? And I wanna show you that in the next slide. This is all we have left, ladies and gentlemen. This is the display case at the Roswell Air Center and they have a whole bunch of models here. And if you look on the top, you see some B-29, some super fortresses, and we'll go ahead and zoom in and I'm gonna show you what we found here. We'll go to the next slide. Here is the model. This is all we have left of straight flush now is a, is a scale model, straight flush Victor, Victor number 85. And you can see the uh, logo on the nose matches precisely with the actual B-29. So, Again, this is all we have left of the most significant aircraft. Now let's move ahead to the next slide here and we'll continue. That's a good shot of the logo, just to show you that that is there. So if you go there today, you can see this model and it just gives you this feeling of what it was like and what the aircraft looked like. It's, it's a really good scale model. So we'll move on to the next slide here. 
Okay, so we talked about the first body flight. Well, actually, that was the second body flight. The first body flight was flown out by a C-54 Skymaster by Oliver Pappy Henderson. And that particular body flight had two bodies plus debris that flew from Roswell Army Airfield directly to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. So this was the first body flight with Pappy Henderson. The second body flight was the B-29 straight flush that we just talked about. So let's go ahead and move on here to the next slide. And we do have some world exclusives for you here today, ladies and gentlemen, brand new information. Here is an illustration by my good friend, Rudy Gardia, and this is a world exclusive. Here you see Pappy Henderson with the C-54, kind of like monitoring the loading of the uh, corpses, you could say. Now, they did build crates. Those were loaded into the port side cargo bay of the C-54 that flew directly to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide now. Okay, once they got to uh, Wright Field, that began the autopsy at the Aero, Aero Medical Lab at, at Dayton, Ohio. This is sometime after July 9th, 1947. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Keep on uh, moving here. Okay, so it's very important that we discuss this gentleman right here. He plays a pivotal role in this whole story. This is Marion Black Mac Magruder, was an ace World War II pilot. And you can just look at this guy. He's got this Hollywood you know, face about him, a good looking gentleman, ace pilot. Uh, he was deployed to England February 6, 1943 to learn about night fighting. Prior to this time, America didn't know anything about night fighting. It was this gentleman who taught America night fighting. He actually wrote a manual and it laid out the entire logistics of what you do with the aircraft, what you do with radar, uh, you know, the logistics of installing things and maps and, and the whole thing about night fighting has everything to do with Marion Black Mac Magruder. The guy was a genius, okay? So we'll move on to the next slide here. And we, we talked about this survivor, this survivor that uh, was picked up by Roswell Army Airfield uh, 509th Bomb Group personnel, the uh, <clears throat> counterintelligence corps or the gentlemen who picked it up. So. Here is the Air War College, class of 1947-1948, and this is Montgomery Field, Alabama. And you can see all these people here. Now, there were two groups of these men who were part of this class. Marion Black Mac Magruder was a part of this. And it's very interesting. Something's happened in April of 1948. All these gentlemen are at this Air War College that you see here. And Marion Black Mac Magruder is with this group. And this mysterious call comes into Maxwell Field, where these guys are at the Air War College, and it's from Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. And the instructions are to board a plane immediately because the government wanted to get their, quote unquote, opinion on something. What could they want to know about? They wanted to get their opinion on something. So all these guys board a plane, and there were two groups of these. And uh, when they got there, and we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide, here it is, uh, Montgomery Field, Alabama. This is the Air War College. And you can see this wraparound road that has a curvature here, kind of on the right-hand side. I've shown you uh, what this actually looks like. If we move on to the next slide, I wanna discuss exactly what we're talking about. If you look at the rightmost quadrant on the upper right, that would be the Air War College area. And you can see this circular road that goes around this whole area. That's where these gentlemen were when this mysterious call came into the Air War College, you know, please board a plane immediately. We have an urgent request. We need to get your opinion on something and it's of the utmost significance. So let's move on to the next slide here and we'll, we'll get into what actually happened. Now, once they got to Wright Field, they were actually a part of this at least week long group of symposiums and lectures that talked about air mobility. They talked about logistics of, uh, uh, aircraft and moving things and it's, it was really about air mobility and for people who are skeptical that Marion Mac Black Magruder and these other ace pilots because this is the best of the best if anyone is skeptical we've actually got the documentation to prove that they were here at this time frame so let's move on to the me next slide here and we'll continue this here what did they see well world exclusive once they got to the actual uh, right field, they were brought into a room 
and these two men with boxes came in and they started handing out this debris to all these World War II pilots. And they were instructed that this came from the Roswell craft in July of 1947. And the government wanted to gauge their reaction to this debris. And they wanted to give it to our ACE pilots to see how they would react. W would they be historical? W would they go crazy or would they be able to handle this? Now, once they were done handing out the debris and all the pilots got to uh, you know, look at this, examine this, the debris was put back into the boxes and then these men were led down this corridor. They made a left-hand turn down another corridor <clears throat> into this windowless room that had a one-way mirror at the back wall. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where they found and saw the survivor, the survivor. He was described as being squiggly, almost Casper the ghost-like. He had an oversized head. He had oversized almond eyes. He had just barely a hint of a nose and a slit for a mouth, hairless. And uh, he also said, and this is according to Black Mac Magruder, that it was alive, but we killed it. It was alive, but we killed it because we were experimenting on it. And he lived from the time we recovered it in July 1947 to April 1948. So he had almost made it an entire year before whatever experiment we had, we killed it. But this is another world exclusive by Rudy Gardier, now bringing it your attention for, for your examination. Now we'll move on to the next slide here. Okay, so what evidence do we have to back up any of this? Well, I was able to get a hold of, through Tom Carey, Mark Magruder, who is uh, Marion Magruder's son. And he uh, allowed me to release this information. It's been talked about before, but here is the actual Air War College study history file declassified, so we're, we're not violating national security here. This is 4748. And if we move forward to the next slide, we'll get a breakdown here. So you can see here's the first cover page here. The Air University Air War College, Maxwell Air Force Base, Montgomery, Alabama. We've got the date here, 24 March 1948. So that checks out mobility planning. And if you look at the lower right hand corner here, you can see uh, they have all of the, the symposiums listed here. Uh, logistics planning program, uh, intelligence. They've got training programs, organization programs. And we'll move on to the next slide and we'll break it down even further. Now, here you can see this. So it's uh, almost 0800, 0900, and it's flight trip to right field, flight trip to right field. So the entire week was blocked out with these men at right field precisely when Marion Black Mac Magruder claims that he was there. It checks out. We've got evidence to back it up. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here. Again, here's the different locations, where they were, what the times were, and what dates they attended some of these lectures here. So you've got room number one, current tactics of air operations. Here's another one, lecture room number one, organization of, uh, let's see, I can't quite read that, uh, air operations. So these give you the, the locations and times where they had these lectures. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide here. Okay, so here is Mark Magruder. I did an interview with him about a month ago now. We did about a two hour interview and he discussed everything his father told him about seeing the debris, the survivor and other alien corpses that were perhaps also associated with the Roswell. So he not only saw the survivor, but he saw other alien corpses as well. And we'll move on to the next slide to just give you some additional proof. Here is his um, Hall of Fame plaque and the medal that he received. This is on his wall. So just to prove that I was there, we actually did interview this gentleman and he's the son of Marion Black Mac Magruder. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide here. And these are all of the composite photographs and you can see his squadron here, Black Max Killers and all the medals. And just to show you that we really did do boots on the ground research for you here. And that's what we do with this channel. We, we give you the real research. This is not right click, save as internet, Monday morning quarterbacking. This is real world boots on the ground research. Okay, let's move on to the next slide here. Okay, so how did this all begin? So when Marion Magruder uh, was with his son, they were watching the Apollo moon landing. This is July 20th, 1969. So we've got Neil Armstrong, this is actually Buzz, but we've got Neil Armstrong on the moon and they're, they're watching this. So you've got Marion Magruder and Merritt Magruder, his son, 
and they're watching the televised TV special about this, like with all the other billions of people around the world, it was one of the last times where we all came together as a united coalition of you know, humans on this planet. There's just a bit of that today. We, we really do need this kind of inspiration. So they're watching this broadcast and there's a commercial. So they go outside onto the deck and it's dark out. They're both looking up at the moon and Merritt Magruder turns to his father and he says, you know, father, do you think there's anybody up there? And this has all happened July 20th, 1960. Do you think there's anyone up there? And, and father turns back to his son. He says, we're not alone. <laughs> And, he, and so his, uh, his son turned back to his father and said, how do you know this? How do you know this? And he says, I know it. Uh, I've seen the evidence. And he couldn't elucidate on it, but he said, I know we're not alone. So a shocking statement. So let's, let's move ahead to some of these statements that uh, Mary Magruder told his son. Now, this, this has been confirmed by Mark Magruder. I've, I've got this from him. So it, I've got the source right here. So statement, statements by Colonel Marion Magruder reference Mark Magruder. Now, here he, here he is here. Quote, I just know, I know for sure. One day you will know. We are not alone in this universe. I can't tell you about it now. Someday, maybe I can tell you. Statement to son Merritt during Apollo moon landing, July 20th, 1969. So think about the source, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about top-notch military pilot that the United States government trusted with some of our greatest secrets. He was an ace pilot, just a fantastic gentleman. These are the kind of credible sources that we can really bank on. Now, he also said here, I was at Air War College when all this happened. I know all about it. I want to see what the show is all about. Then maybe I can tell you more. My whole class was made privy to that information. We will watch the show. I can't talk about it now. It's top secret. We will talk about it once I see what they reveal on the show. Statement on in 81 or 82 during a commercial break for Dallas highlighting a promo regarding a breaking documentary on a possible UFO crash in Roswell during 1947. So here they're watching this Dallas thing and this, this TV promo breaks in into the uh, show and they're talking about a Roswell documentary coming up. And he wants to see what they release before he talks about it. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide for a couple more statements here. Now, he described uh, some of these things and what it looked like. It was not like the aliens depicted on TV, except for a large head. Instead of a gray in color, this being was more flesh tone, wearing a flight suit, human-like, but not like any human being I have ever seen. Squiggly is a good way to describe it. Clearly not from this planet. And he says it will continue. They were all small in stature. So that tells you right now that he saw more than one. Humanoid, somewhat Asian, looking clearly. Uh, they were not of this world. We all knew they were not of this world. They had extra long digits with suction cups at the end of their fingers. Their arms were this and long, out of proportion, longer than human. Their elbows were a lot further down. They were like little children without any hair, about four feet tall. They had almond-shaped eyes, a little larger than human. The mouth was just a small slit, not much of a nose, no ears like some of the drawings. And then he went in and he, to say here, they all think the bodies are at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but they are at Eglin Air Force Base in vast underground cold storage vaults there. Statement after watching a documentary about Roswell. So here we see, ladies and gentlemen, the description of the bodies, the description of the survivor, what the head looked like, what the arms looked like. It had this gangly, dangling, squiggly looking configuration for his body. And also talking about things being stored at Eglin Air Force Base. And we'll move on to the next slide here. Okay, so what happens next? So this was a trip to Roswell. And why am I showing you a glider museum? because, and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later here, but I recommend if you're going through uh, Albuquerque on your way to Roswell, stop by this soaring museum. It's a very inspirational place and they have uh, foreign designs, domestic designs. They've got kit planes, certified designs, very low drag coefficient, high L over D designs where you can glide for 60 miles. So we'll move on to the next slide. I'll, I'll take you for a real quick tour around here. Some of these are wooden designs, but some that you can build yourself, but really nice great place to go we'll move on to the next slide great that's exactly correct some of these are 
very low drag coefficient, high L over D. We'll move on to the next slide. Now, the reason why I'm showing you the glider port is because literally a quarter mile from the glider port was this place, Antique Auto and Toy Museum. So I'm driving to Roswell and I see this glider port. And then as I'm leaving the glider port, I see this toy museum. And they, they were closing in 30 minutes. So I said, I got to get over here right now. And this, they let me in and I took some photographs. So you can see here, they have these tin toys. Nothing was for sale. It was all just for display. And they've got cars, they've got station wagons, they've got, uh, you know, different little toy trucks here. And they had uh, vintage cars rusting out in the field. It, it just had this kind of a, a ghostly appeal. We'll move on here. I'll take you through some of the vehicles here. Nothing was for sale here. And, uh, and we'll move on to the next slide. You can see some of these parked out here. And so while I was on this trip, good call, we'll, we'll stay on this for a bit. I asked the owners, and this gentleman's name is Archie Lewis. I asked him, I just point blank, I said, well, are the rumors true? And he said, what rumors? And I said, you know, the rumors are about Roswell. And so this gentleman started opening up to me. Uh, and I interviewed this guy with my phone. So I, I have him on tape now. I, I have the video. I interviewed this guy for about 30 minutes. And what he told me, I think, is very interesting to our subject matter today. Because he said that his, his sister, back on July 2nd, 1947, the exact same day this all happened, they were in Vaughn, New Mexico, which is 100 nautical miles north of Roswell, and they were riding horseback. So it was his sister and two of their friends riding horseback in Vaughn, New Mexico. And this strange UFO made one orbit around all three girls riding horseback and totally freaked them out. They were shook to their core. They came back and told Archie Lewis about it, and he told me about it. Uh, two of the girls have now, I believe, are, are deceased, but one is still alive, and she lives in Albuquerque. So she could be tracked down and she could verify the story, but this was on the exact same day that this all happened in July, 1947. And I don't think to this time frame there has been any other witness in Vaughn, New Mexico of the same craft. So we'll move on to the next slide here. I've got the, the map here showing you Roswell at the lower right, and then Vaughn, New Mexico is roughly about 100 miles north of Roswell. So that's the site picture here. We'll move on to the next one now. Okay. What I did next then is I put together a flyer and I put all the information together. Who was involved, when they were involved, when the body flights were uh, brought out, what B-29s were involved, talk about the crash scene, talk about uh, Rancher Mac Brazel, put that all together. And I sent this flyer out to all EAA chapters in the entire state of New Mexico. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I got crickets for a response put all this work into this, you've spent all this money putting this flyer together. I virtually got no response except for the fact of one person. And I'm just gonna rip through this little flyer really quickly here. And just to show you what these men from the EAA chapters got, and we'll stay on this slide for just a second here. Roswell UFO crash retrieval. Attention, after more than 75 years, the truth can finally be revealed regarding what has commonly been referred to as the quote unquote Roswell incident. On the night of July 2nd, 1947, an egg shaped object of unknown origin crashed on the Foster Ranch approximately 35 miles north of Roswell, New Mexico. The craft measured approximately 13 feet across and had a brushed aluminum exterior surface. On the morning of July 3rd, Local rancher Mac Brazel discovered mysterious debris scattered over the ranch. The debris consisted of hundreds of tin foil looking shreds of material that spread out like liquid mercury after being folded up by hand and released. Other debris, including extremely thin material that could not be cut, burned, or dented with a 16 pound sledgehammer. Finally, multiple small I-beam shaped debris was recovered, which included strange hieroglyphic writing or symbols on the inside wall. By July 8th, military personnel from the 509th Bomb Group stationed at Roswell Army Airfield arrived on the scene to begin the retrieval operation. They discovered five bodies associated with the craft and one was still alive. By 4 p.m. on July 8th, multiple eyewitnesses in Roswell observed a military convoy traveling down Main Street 
heading the direction of the base. This convoy consisted of multiple Jeeps and a low boy tractor trailer, which was carrying an egg shaped craft concealed by a large tarp. Minutes later, the convoy arrived at hangar P3 building 84, where the construction of a large wooden crate began. The remaining deceased alien corpses were carefully placed into child-sized caskets and loaded into the crate. On the morning of July 9th, the bodies contained within the crate were loaded into the bomb bay of a B-29 called Straight Flush and subsequently flown to 8th Air Force Headquarters, Fort Worth, Texas. At least one body was flown in a C-54 by pilot Oliver Pappy Henderson directly to the Aeromedical Lab at Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio for autopsy. If you or anyone you know has firsthand experience dealing with the Roswell debris, crash UFO, or extraterrestrial bodies recovered, please preserve an important part of our national history by contacting military aerospace historian Michael Schrapp below. So that's what I sent out. I got one response that had some legs to it, and we'll move on to the next slide here. One of these gentlemen was a part of the EAA chapter. Uh, I spoke to the director of the EAA chapter. He actually printed out my flyer and he gave it to the chapter members. And one of the chapter members was a friend of Timothy D. Proctor, That's that young seven-year-old boy that I showed you at the beginning who was riding horseback with rancher Mac Brazel. He was friends with D. Proctor. And this is the takeaway that he told me. Number one, he stated to him that D told him that he held the Roswell debris. He had seen at least one body, probably two, which is called the D Proctor site. And he said that, uh, mentioned that D told him that he was not threatened by the military, but his parents were because he was only seven years at the time. So he was not threatened, but his parents were. And so that's the takeaway from this gentleman. And we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you for a tour of the Air Center at Roswell Army Airfield. This is the Hangar P3 Building 84 where all of the debris was taken, where the bodies were taken. This is the exterior. We'll move on to the next slide. I contacted the uh, manager of the airport. He gave me the name and number of the gentleman who's in charge of the maintenance facility. And this guy agreed to meet with me and he gave me a two hour tour of the entire facility inside the hangar. And uh, this is looking outside, looking at the other wall or the entryway to Hangar P3 Building 84. We'll move on to the next slide. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you into the most historic hangar in the world. And I'm going to get you within plus or minus six inches where they actually laid the bodies down on the hangar floor. It's got this interesting aura about it. We'll move on to the next slide here. Take you inside the hangar. This is it. So the uh, 18-wheeler tractor trailer would have been here. We've got the troop transport would have been here. The ambulance truck would have been here. The caskets would have been laid out somewhere where this uh, white pickup truck is. And then between these two is where they would have laid out the body. So we'll move on to the next slide. Here's the other view looking through the other section. So this whole hangar facility would have been kind of filled up with a chaotic situation where they're building a crate. They're loading the caskets into the crate with the bodies. This is a hush hush operation. It's being done in real time. We'll move on to the next slide here. Over here is probably where they kept some of the uh, sections of the debris and also the ambulance truck. We'll move on to the next slide. And I've got a picture of the floor. And ladies and gentlemen, this has got to be the location where they set down the bodies. Just standing there is just historic. You, you do get the feel of something there. You kind of do get the feeling of a, of a historic event that happened 75 years ago where the bodies were at this location. We'll move on to the next slide now. Okay, so we're gonna take you for a tour around here. This is the outside section of the air center where they do maintenance, they do storage, and they do scrapping of commercial airliners. We'll keep moving on to the next slide here. So you've got 747s, you've got DC-10s and various kind of sections of dilapidated disrepair condition. The scrapping operation, good call, we're moving forward here. Commercial airliners kind of being parked out there. But there's a very specific aircraft that I want to talk about. And we'll keep on moving on here. What does Elvis have to do with this presentation? I mean, why, why am I showing you a picture of Elvis? And what does he have to do with Roswell? I mean, am I going off the wall here? What does Elvis have to do? Well, if you move on to the next slide, it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, that Elvis's jet star is stationed 
at the Air Center at Roswell Army Airfield, which is now the Air Center. Here is Elvis's plane. I mean, it's for sale. I got to ride up to it. I touched it. It just had this great aura about it. It's a nice looking ship. Um, it is for sale. It would take millions of dollars to get it back to FAA certified uh, flight status. You can see it's got this opaque window, kind of cracked, dilapidated disrepair. You've got a little bit of uh, weeds growing up into the wheel wells, chip paint. It's got this ghostly appeal, but it's Elvis's plane. So I asked this gentleman, we'll move on to the next one. I'll give you another view here. Interesting ship, really nice aircraft. They've removed the engines for storage purposes and it is for sale. I asked this gentleman who's giving me this tour, what did Elvis know about Roswell? He also told me that this plane has been sitting here since 1977. It's been here all this time and you can actually see this thing. And he said that through Elvis's worldwide connections all around the world and his connections with the CIA, his connections with Richard Nixon, it is very possible that Elvis knew something about Roswell. Now, he really never talked about it, but with his connections, he might have known something. We'll move on to the next slide now. Now, I'm going to take you inside the Roswell UFO Research and uh, Library area. This is the actual library of the museum. They did an impeccable job, very well done. It's extremely clean. It's open to the public. Let's move on to the next slide here. And I'll take you to the research archives. So this is kind of where I live. This is where I excel here, you know, getting down into the boxes where no one else goes. Some people walk in here, but they took a look at these boxes and they walk right out. Here you've got 250 boxes of all this historical data. And it's like, no one cares. It's just sitting here. So someone's got to dig through this stuff and pull out these obscure cases. Let's move on to the next slide. Here's what these boxes look like. So this is boots on the ground research. So I, I was able to go over there. I plugged in my scanner, my laptop, and just started scanning documents for all of you watching this. This is the return on investment here. And we'll give you some examples of what these obscure cases look like. Now, they had these two carousels with these binders on there. I allowed myself two days to kind of go through this material. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you look at this left carousel, on the top section of this left carousel, I didn't even make it through that first top <laughs> section of the left carousel. There was so much information to provide for all of you, and we'll get into some cases here, that I never even made it. Okay, so this is talking about the Mansfield, Ohio. This is one of these ironclad cases that uh, had to do with the Army helicopter, Colonel Coyne. This went all the way to the United Nations where they saw this somewhat cigar shaped craft that had a red light. It also had a white light on top. And then this green light shined down from the craft, hit the helicopter, raised it. It's a big story, I've covered it before, but these are some of the original sketches. And this is what you find when you do real world boots on the ground research. Let's move on to the next slide here, just to give you an idea. This was another case that we've talked about before, but here's some of the newspaper clippings. Uh, Richmond Times, and this is the, the date here, Thursday, January 14th, 1965, where we've talked about this prior to this large uh, 90 foot wide beehive shaped UFO comes chasing after this driver and they go into this in great detail. Let's move on to the next slide here. Here's another case. This is in uh, Montana area, UFO sighting December 25th, 1976, uh, not too far. Uh, from Helena, where this craft was seen by two eyewitnesses who drove over a hill. And when they got to the top, they saw this craft, original sketch, uh, Cascade, Montana, and then a uh, three page report to go with the sketch. And then we'll move on to the next slide here. Okay, so we talk about strange, lost, forgotten, and obscure cases. And I've got one for you here. This is Bell Boys UFO event. Uh, we've got the date here, we've got the location, and there's really not too much. August 10th, 1961, and this is in uh, Ohio, and you're, you, you don't hear much about this, and that's what I like about it. It's because it's just obscure, it's not talked about, it's forgotten, it's lost, it's been buried. This is exactly what I like about these cases, the ones that you haven't heard of before. But it's not completely unprecedented because I've got at least two other cases of these bell-shaped UFOs. So, Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I prepared for you uh, today. Thank you for your attention. Again, we're gonna continue to do this boots on the ground research 
and any support we get will be turned right back into the research to commission more artwork, more research trips, and really bringing this uh, important history alive through the use of full color illustrations. And I want to thank you for your attention. And that tells you that there is something out there. Pretty hard to spoof that. Absolutely, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge National Labs, MacDill Air Force Base, Edwards Air Force Base, the remote test site in Nevada, also known as Air Force Flight Test Center Detachment 3. That's the actual terminology for Groom Lake facility. From what I hear you guys saying, there's something. I don't know who's building it, who's got the technology, who's got the brains, but there's, there's something out there that better than our airplane. So it's not us, that's one thing we know. We know that. I could say that with a very high degree of confidence. For someone to try to bust down the walls, it's not going to happen. You'd have to go to all these facilities, get into their vaults, then bring that out as a united coalition. Not one person couldn't do it. It would take a united coalition of acknowledged scientists to come forward with it.